alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. How would you describe what the circle is to, say, your grandmother? It's the chaos of the web made elegant. Speed round, Paul or John? Early Paul, late John. Mario or Sonic? Early Sonic, late Mario. Needs of the society or needs of the individual? Should be the same. You're most scared of? Unfulfilled potential. I am a believer in the perfectibility of human beings. We are our best selves. The possibilities are endless. At the circle, there isn't a problem that we cannot solve. We can cure any disease and we can end hunger without secrets, without the hoarding of knowledge and information. We can finally realize our potential. Circlers, do you like to share? We'll see it all. If it happens, we'll know. Imagine the human rights implications. There needs to be accountability. What is this? The circle has the power to change everything. It's only our lies that get us in trouble. Things we hide. We care about everybody you care about. Because knowing is good. But knowing everything is better. Welcome back to Media Monarchy, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more. And we are about to enter the circle. On the line, we've got our buddy Jared. He's on the tweets at G3RD3R. Jared, thanks so much for joining us, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So it was it was in, I think, the chat or the tweets the other day that the subject of the new film called The Circle came up. And I didn't actually realize that The Circle was originally, and of course it's opening in theaters on on the Friday, as, as you and I are talking right now, it's Tuesday, April 25th, 2017. The film version of The Circle is opening everywhere this Friday, April 28th. But you knew that it was a book first by Dave Eggers, and you've actually read that book. So I wanted to talk to you to kind of maybe we can do a little bit of book smarts slash deep focus. We can look at a book and look at a film at the same time and talk about this new movie, The Circle. It's got Tom Hanks and Emma Watson and all kinds of other recognizable faces, and it's also about the recognizable technological overreach. So what did you think about the book, just kind of your, your basic thumbnail sketch? Uh, yeah, the book came out, I think, in 2014, and um, I read it pretty soon after it came out. I had read a couple of other Dave Eggers books and was interested, you know, to read more. And uh, instantly, it just it felt very familiar with the level of technology in our daily lives, and it wasn't. It's kind of set in a not too distant future where there there's a little more reach um, and privacy issues of technology coming in. So it immediately felt relatable um immediately felt creepy i think you know i didn't touch my facebook account for two weeks after reading it but then slowly i forgot about you know that kind of feeling and and started to participate in social media again so um yeah i think um the book definitely has themes that are completely relatable and serve as a as a canary in a coal mine or a, a whatever the phrase is uh for a cautionary tale uh for things that um we should be on the lookout for so we'll include the links to, of course, all the trailers, all the Wikipedia entries and anything else that we mentioned in the show notes for this conversation. I'm looking at it says it came out October 2013. The book did. That's still a pretty damn fast turnaround. And I think, you know, the powers that shouldn't be know that stories like this. Well, you ain't got a whole bunch of time. You probably need to hop on it and, and get this story told as quickly as possible or someone else is going to beat you to the story. It kind of seems in some ways maybe this is Dave Eggers' kind of uh, Brave New World or 1984-style book. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, given that he's written some screenplays, this this book was probably written um, with a film in mind. His previous mm. book, Hologram for the King, was also made into a film with Tom Hanks um, previously. So it seems like the book may have had the green light on it for a film right away. Um, but yeah, uh, in terms of the Brave New World stuff um, – it definitely um, kind of distills everything. The company of the circle is a, 
a Facebook, Apple, Google, PayPal, Uber, all under one house kind of a uh, place where May gets a job. It's a dream job. She's stuck in working in insurance and she gets offered a job because her friend works there and she snatches it right up and quickly kind of becomes indoctrinated to the practices of working at the circle. And it basically it sort of takes over your life. So it, it, what starts as maybe this is a cool job and it has that look of, you know, and we've seen lots of different shows, whether it's even the, you know, the fun betas or, or uh, Silicon Valley or those what an amazing job to have. You can hang out and kind of have fun all day. But the trailers of the film, it almost seems a bit like Black Mirror. If you're familiar with the that television show, Charlie Brooker. There was a, that one, huh? there's it, Black Mirror is kind of the umbrella of show. It's almost like a Twilight Zone anthology kind of thing. There was an episode, and now, of course, the title's going to escape me, where everyone is judged purely by their online appearance and everyone spends all their time making sure that they're a, that all their ratings are up high. It's almost like a giant Sims game where all your Definitely. little ratings, all your little bars need to be filled or you're going to cry and, and piss on the floor. Yeah, definitely. It's, it, it plays on that gaming mechanics kind of mentality where um, she has a job in customer service and she has one screen in front of her to respond to customer complaints and deal with things. And then she has another screen that's messages, internal messages. And then she has another screen that's uh, all of her social accounts and activity. And she ends up having like nine screens in front of her at the end of the book um, for all these different things. But um, after her first week, of doing an excellent job in customer service, her supervisor comes to her and says, wow, you're not participating on campus. We really missed you at the social functions. What did you do this weekend? And she's like, oh, I went home. My dad was sick. He's like, well, well what were you doing? And she's like, well, we watched some basketball. And he's like, well, why weren't you posting about that or commenting? We have all mm. these people who love basketball that love to hear your opinion on it. And she's like, oh, I didn't know I, I should do that. And so she kind of slowly gets brought in with all of these ways that she should be participating. And when she joins the company, her, her personal laptop is, is taken and synced up into the network right away. And apparently she went on some vacation to Portugal at one time. So she automatically got it added to this people who love Portugal group and gets sent a invite for a Portugal lunch by somebody and she doesn't RSVP to it. And so she, um, gets called in by HR because the person who threw the lunch felt bad that she never RSVP'd and didn't show up to it. And so not participating in this lunch that she never signed up for ends up being a, something that's against her, which is strange to me. Well, and it's strange, but it's not that far away. And as, as you kind of said, this takes place. I don't know if they ever really kind of lay it out. It's in a very, you know, the not too distant future. So it feels like a very comfortable now that we're already living in. But with just, you know, a couple of extra, you know, bells and whistles and little bits. Yeah, of it's like a dust. Joaquin Phoenix movie, Her, how that kind of was set slightly futuristic, mm. but very relatable. Well, I'm trying to look up what the title of that Black Mirror episode was. But I think as we kind of look at all these things, there's a part about the health and the dad and the film. Actually, I don't know if this is going to be Bill Paxton's final appearance or not, but he plays May's father. So so talk about the connection between all of our health and the circle. Yeah, definitely. So May um, is dealing with her dad has MS and um, she has to go home. And, and when she does, she kind of gets reprimanded for not being um, socially active on campus at the circle or online that weekend that she's visiting her dad. And it comes out that he has MS. And so her friend who got her the job is like, well, we can easily add them to your health plan. And so this ends up being a kind of a complete change around for his health because they're great services are offered to the family and, and he starts to improve and all these great things are happening. But along with it comes all of these monitors and cameras in the house to kind of keep tabs on him and make sure he's doing okay. And, and the parents are not okay with kind of that invasion of privacy. And uh, the one thing that um, is interesting at the circle, they have regular checkups. They wear this Fitbit like bracelet that tells them all their vitals. Um, and so when she goes to the doctor for the first time, the doctor um, says, here, get, swallow this, you know, cup of whatever. And she's like, oh, what was that? And she goes, oh, it's the sensor that's now going to be inside of you that interacts with a bracelet. And that, um, to me, was just like, oh, there goes, you know, any sort of informed consent. You know, the doctor's just tricking her into swallowing the sensor, which is now going to interact with this Fitbit-like device. 
and so the dad has this same device also in the in the in the family has cameras all in the house and um it ends up catching them in a uh not not the cameras in the house but later there ends up being a moment on camera that the parents don't want to be caught on camera hmm so what is um and of course they I'm sure I'm sure they don't mention anything like Fitbit or any actual brand names do they? No, they have all these you know names that Eggers came up with for all the products, you know, they they have this something called Sea Change which is all the cameras, it's these lollipop sized cameras that can be placed anywhere indiscreetly hmm. and you can check in on them whenever you want. You can you can have friends friend your camera so they have access to your camera. So you know Orwell's 1984, you know, exponentially there. Um, they have something called Love Love, which is like a dating app, which allows you to basically um, mine data mine the entire web for a person that you're interested in to find out their likes and dislikes. And if you're to ask them out to dinner where they might want to go and if they have any allergies and, you know, what kind of dates you might want to take them on and things like that. Um they have eventually they they develop something called democracy, which is like a democracy system. They realize <laughs> that they have more people signed up for circle accounts than there are registered voters, and so they make the natural leap of well, why don't we administer all the voting? You know, we have an an obvious system that's set up and ready to go. We could require it of all users that they have to vote, uh, or else they're locked out of their computer and all their systems until they vote, and so they they create that. Um, they have something called past perfect where they, uh, take all of videos and all photos from all time, scan them into a system to kind of put together your genealogy of the past. And, um, that ends up coming to haunt May's friend is the per is kind of the test person for this. And she ends up finding things in her family's closet that she doesn't want to be known. So that kind of comes back but yeah every app and program it's not you know name brand stuff that we know there's all these clever futuristic names for the things they invent so true you is that kind of the facebook oh yeah true true you is kind of the start of it all so um true you is is the idea that you can no longer be anonymous online um you have to be Mm. your true self so you can only sign up for an account if you can document who you are and where you live and all your personal information and this will connect to your bank account as well so it's you know gone are the days of hiding in the darkness and and being a troll everybody has to be their true self online um so that's kind of what kicks it all off the the uh the original kid genius behind the circle is this person named ty so they speculate the true you is his initials as well hmm now i mean this seems like a, a in some ways a large world to kind of lay out how quickly do you think they'll 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 rattle through this in the film i think that yeah i think the exposition points will be pretty uh quick to establish the world of the campus of the circle they'll probably you know show may in her desolate hometown in fresno and then um coming to the the technological advanced campus and there's definitely lots of bells and whistles to show off and uh things to entice her to want to stay on campus they have um hotel rooms that anybody can sign up for because if if they stay after work for an event on campus they invite you know top list musicians to come play for them and they have chefs come and cook for them and all all this great stuff to make people not want to leave and they even have hotel rooms that people can check into with clean clothes that they can grab for the next day and go back to work so it's definitely this kind of utopia that's set up within the circle um, to make people not really want to leave to just come to work participate online and um, increase their uh, there's this thing called party rank also which is uh their rank within i think there's ten thousand employees at the circle and so um they rank each one based on their participation online and so every time someone comments on a photo, uploads something, gives a review, et cetera, you get more points. And so uh, May is chastised for having a low party rank and not participating well. And so she pulls an all-nighter and gets her rank up higher, you know, to be in the top 2000s, considered like a great feat, and that you're uh, a tastemaker for the circle. And if you recommend products that people then buy, um, 
there's a there's a certain expectation right. that you'll you'll have a quota of forty thousand dollars a month or something like that, with that you recommend products and people buy it and that translates to a, a dollar figure that you are responsible for. It's like oh you made that sale happen so you get credit for it. So um, yeah, it's definitely this kind of utopia agenda twenty one type environment where people are supposed to just come and plug in and be happy. And it all sounds so insane and out there yet completely mundane and already right here right now we're talking to our buddy jared about the new film the circle which is based on the book and dave eggers actually did do the screenplay along with the director of the film james ponsold and it's got music by danny elfman and it's got pat oswald in it and all kinds of great names so i looked up nosedive is the episode of black mirror the British science fiction anthology series. This episode set in an alternative reality where people can rate one another using their phones and where your ratings can impact your entire life. It tells the story of Lacey, a young woman overly obsessed with her ratings who, after being chosen by her popular childhood friend as the maid of honor for her wedding, sees it as an opportunity to improve her ratings and achieve her dreams. But it's basically where you it almost has this minority report overlay where everything you do and every interaction is already sort of being mediated and and sort of forced on you and these sort of happy, smiley interactions with everybody, whether or not you feel that way inside. And that, again, kind of reminds me of Brave New World. What if you want to just live in the badlands and live in the in the bad areas? That's almost not allowed. And when we think about the other sorts of, I mean, Soylent Green to Land of the Dead, the George Romero zombie film... A lot of our sci-fi is basically about compact cities where all your needs are taken care of as long as you adhere to the rules. And if you dare to run afoul or dare to leave, you know, what waits for you outside? There'll be some type of other, some type of zombie, some type of ostracized death. Is that too much? No, I think that's <laughs> that's spot on. And May's got a, um ex boyfriend who's like her high school boyfriend that when she goes home she sees and he's the complete opposite live off the land hunter he makes chandeliers out of deer antlers kind of guy and she tries to um post his chandeliers online to get more business to him and her phone and his phone start like blowing up and 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 he's like what's going on she's like oh you're famous and some architect in finland likes your work or whatever and he totally resists all of this and he he gets really frustrated because the only communication that they have is through the filter of the social media accounts and he wants real communication he wants nothing to do with it and they have dinner with her parents and and he's saying you know there's three people sitting here wanting to have a conversation with you and you're looking for strangers in dubai you know so he's definitely the antithesis of of the world and um at one point he decides to just completely cut off he writes her a letter and says, don't try to contact me. I'm going to go as far off the grid as I can go. I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. And at, by this point in the book, um, May is living a completely transparent life, which means she's wearing a camera on a necklace, which records her every kind of move, talk, everything, everything she does throughout the day. And so as she's reading this letter, she's seeing comments come in from her viewers saying, oh, this guy's a jerk. Why would you ever be with him? And people are like, automatically taking his words and making memes out of it and huh. making funny videos to kind of ridicule his um, perspective on life. And so his name's Mercer. He decides to go off the grid. And then um, later they decide to try out this new software or new, new program to track down anyone in the world, basically. It's called Soul Search. And so they use it to try and find a criminal first. And so they, they pull up this person in a foreign country and they say, here's who we're looking for. All right. Circle account users have at it, and people start um, crowdsourcing all this information about who the person is. They do facial recognition on the photos to identify possible people in the country that it could be. Um, they know that she's in this certain country because she can no longer travel abroad. And within six minutes and 33 seconds, they basically find her and have her in handcuffs. And so they say, oh, that was great. We, we did it on a criminal. Now can we use it to find just an average person? And so she decides to bring up her boyfriend her ex-boyfriend, as the person, just as a way to, as an olive branch to reach out to him, I think, <laughs> you know, to say, we're not all bad. They were using technology for good. And so, again, everybody goes into hyperdrive. They find him. Um, 
people start running around the corner with their cell phone cameras out trying to document him, yelling his name. He jumps in his pickup and heads off. Drones start flying in. And there's this whole manhunt that, that comes and basically kind of shows you that you may have your limit with technology and you may have your place where you no longer want to um, participate in it, but the system's going to keep pushing the limit. And no matter what, when we cut off, we think we're off the grid, it's going to find a way to find us, basically. And that's, uh, you know, that extrapolates wider out to just AI in general, that once it maybe achieves a certain, you know, tipping point, there will be no stopping it. And yeah, sort of, you know, once you turn it on, there's no way to turn it off. So you mean there's some kind of big, crazy technological manhunt? That doesn't sound like anything I've seen in the news very recently, does it? Uh, not at all. No, no uh, not de- at all. Fir- I mean, the first thing I thought about when I read this was uh, the Christopher Dorner of course. Uh, situation in Los Angeles with his big manifesto about the LAPD and the big manhunt that happened there. So that was, you know, definitely on my mind when I first read it. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, we've had the situation in Cleveland just recently that once again seems well-timed with this movie release. And as we were scrolling around through some stuff last night even when we were having dinner i saw ooh, running man it's on instant watch (laughs) and that's another great comparison is i think you know we'll we'll take part in it you know whether you want to or not in a lot of ways because it'll still just sort of exist and you'll be in this culture and there's the part of running man where it's all sort of fabricated on tv fakery where they've they've changed an event to make it look like he's a war criminal and all of these things are ultimately manipulatable. So this is, you know, the scary thing about a lot of it is how here this already is. It's not a, you know, in the year 2050 set. It's no. I mean, and even, you know, the agendas that we talk about 2030, not very far away. Yeah, uh, I'm expecting the movie to look very modern. You know, there'll be a, there'll be a couple of gadgets or touchscreen interfaces, you know, probably things that we're not used to seeing, but there's nothing about this book that seems futuristic to me. So what are some of the other elements that we should still kind of hit on while we're talking about this? And it's funny, the more we talk about it, the more I'm like, should I go see this? I haven't actually gone to see a movie in a long time, but I I have a feeling it's going to be terrible actually. So (laughs) I think, you know, (laughs) read the book, you know, maybe, but, um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, and and that's you know that's maybe a larger question we could possibly only speculate about that you know I feel like Tom Hanks went went weird years ago and at some point just started to do war movies which of course World War II movies are CIA movies he wanted to make the Vincent Bugliosi reclaiming history thing about all the JFK truth that Bugliosi had in his massive book at some point he almost seemed to turn into some kind of cutout some kind of intelligence cut out do you have any any speculation any thoughts about that or emma watson for that matter intimately yeah. connected to the united nations yeah definitely um i'm thinking of was it bridge of spies bridge of spies called, yeah. yeah bridge of spies with uh, tom hanks yeah i mean he's he's playing the same types of characters he's not trying for anything new so well it's kind of like robert de niro as well that at definitely. some point in their career you kind of look and go oh you are you and and other guys have talked about this. Tom Secker and others have, have kind of detailed people like Robert De Niro and their connection to intelligence officers and Chase Bannon and some of these other kind of CIA Hollywood guys. That's the thing that I find really interesting about something like The Circle that has so many, you know, so many big names attached to it. And it's coming out, you know, and, you know, I'm sure it's going to open everywhere, I would imagine, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it's got the whole, you know, following of, a generation who saw Emma Watson as Hermione Granger, you know, as their it, it girl. You know, I was talking to somebody else about this the other day, and they go, "Oh, so they're kind of playing to all the computer nerds who have a crush on Emma Watson." I was like, "Yeah, that probably, probably is the the case." Because now she's all grown up. So, I mean, what does this kind of say about, and what does it kind of detail as far as sort of narcissistic millennials, if you will? Oh yeah, I mean, definitely it ties into uh, you know the need for instant gratification or that social capital that you were talking about earlier. Um, the circle also has this, this, uh, philosophy that nothing gets deleted. So if someone takes a photo or a video of you that you don't want to exist, it's, they're not allowed to do it. It's just going to go deep into the memory banks and hope that nobody, 
uh, sees it or has access to it. You know, and this this thing really, um, this idea really struck me because when I do kind of bring up this topic with friends to kind of test the waters of how deep they want to talk about these kinds of things, the the common response I get is, well, I've got nothing to hide. So why should I worry about if there's a camera or, you know, whatever, like when the WikiLeaks about the Samsung TV came out, mm-hmm. I, I was mentioning it to someone and like, oh, who cares? My life is boring. If they, they see me sitting around in, in my underwear, who cares? You know? And so that to me is just kind of is, is baffling that, there's we're being conditioned to accept that the cameras are always on Mm -hmm. and who cares you know or that or that people who say well i have nothing to hide are then going to push for it because they think that the people who do have things to hide need to be um caught doing whatever it is they're doing well and is that something that you know the assanges and snowdens of the world are doing is sort of normalizing the idea of going yes you are being spied on by everything but of course you're not going to stop using any of these devices Right. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, I, you know, after reading the book, I went cold turkey on social media and then came right back to it. So, yeah. well, and, and what about and, and I forget, I feel like I've gotten an email or a message from someone about this as well. The idea that open sourcing of things will be another kind of flip of something, you know, that, that we ostensibly have pushed the open source of everything. And then it will be basically re- switched around like a weapon. Sure. Yeah, the manhunt that happens, definitely it's an open source thing. It's not criminal justice experts looking for someone. It's people just using the tools that they have, um, which is a a scary thought. There's definitely a a mob mentality that's at play. And that's, I think, maybe an important argument to make when people say, oh, well, I don't have anything to hide. It's like, well, what if... You are falsely accused, as we know happens again and again and again and again. What? There was something in New York recently. Was it in New York? Some 21,000 cases thrown out because, you know, the, the, the chemical forensic worker faked a bunch of the evidence. And that's just human diabolical error, not, not, to, not to mention if any of the technology actually bugs out. So what uh, – let me ask you, what's 368 frowns about? Oh, <laughs> um, so she, um, they, when they test democracy, which is the voting system, they just use the 10,000 circle employees to kind of test it out and they ask four questions. Um, the first one is what should we serve at lunch? You know, like, should we have more vegan options or something like that? The second thing is, um, something about take your daughter to work day. And then the third thing is, um, uh, lays out some political overseas thing and, and, and says should we drop a bomb on this country because we know this person is hiding there and there might be a casualty of this many people is it worth it so it's, they're asking the people to vote on this type of political um military action and then the fourth question is is may awesome or what you know just as a way to like thank her for coming up with this idea of doing the democracy <laughs> within the circle and so um Everyone's supposed to vote with a smile or a frown. That's their way of saying yes or no. Um, in this kind of needing to talk in emoticon world, and so she has a you know resounding awesome rate. But she finds out that 368 people frowned to that question. It starts to bug her on the inside. She has to she she starts obsessing like who are these 368 people? Are they people I see every day? W- w- why don't they like me? Um, what did I do wrong? Who could it be? And then her, her boyfriend is, uh, works on the software side of things. He, he can look into the computer and find out exactly who those 368 people are. And he starts naming off people and she's like, I don't want to know, but then it continues to, to bug her. So I think along with the idea of the narcissism, uh, we have 10,000 people voting if they like you or not. And even though a wide majority say yes, they like you. 368 people say no, and how that's going to always bug you, unless you have a hundred percent, you know, likable rate. And this goes back to her work in customer service. They have this, they have this practice where, after helping someone with a customer service issue, you're supposed to send them a customer survey. And I'm sure this is something that you receive all the time when you go somewhere. You get an email follow up or something in the mail, some sort of survey. How was your service? And you rate them. And so they're taught that if they get less than 100% to follow up and say, well, I noticed you only gave me 97%. Is there anything else I could have done to make your 
you know, service mm-hmm. better. And then you do that for them and then you send them another survey in hopes that they'll get you to a hundred percent. And so to me, the idea that, you know, 368 frowns is not good enough. There's always trying to satisfy the customer. And it seems a lot in our culture today that people are, companies are more worried about the satisfaction of customers as opposed to providing a good quality product or a service or or whatever it is. The, the experience, the product can be complete garbage as long as the person felt, you know, good about the the interaction, then you you have a repeat customer. And so that's just kind of the mentality of, of the circle where even if a small percentage frown at you, you want to win them over. Well, it's all perception. That's what it all kind of comes down to. We don't really care if the service is no good. We don't really care if our product falls apart. But as long as we're perceived as, you know, Coke is it or any of those kind of things. It, yeah. That's, ah, oh, God. We're talking about The Circle, the book, and the film with our buddy Jared. He's on the tweets at g 3 R D three R. What does that mean? I'm I'm stumbling over it. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a nickname actually, uh, with the E's replaced with threes. I was thirty three when I made. I was thirty three years old and I made the online moniker before my knowledge of the <laughs> symbology of thirty three. So I just kind of kept it. Girder. Girder. Yeah. So there's also some thirty threes that show up in the book as well. Yeah, there's just a bunch of little mentions that. Um, the Eggers places into it. Nothing that takes more than a sentence that kind of caught my eye. Like I said, the, one of the fugitives is caught in six minutes and 33 seconds. Um, when they talk about an online uh, dating app within the company, they specifically say um, only 33% of employees here are married. The other 67% are looking for love. You know, so just small mentions like that. And there's also mentions of, uh, of you know, the obligatory tinfoil hat reference for anyone who thinks otherwise. Um, there's a brief mention of someone working on security, but not being like a Mossad agent type security. <laughs> um, at the end, someone, you know, kind of writes a manifesto of why we shouldn't have this technology, which is, I think, a word that's getting thrown around once in a while. Uh, Julian Assange gets an honorable mention at one point as well. So Eger is playing with the language and and references within to the realm of people who may think this way without kind of going too deep into it. What about Pence's wife? I was just talking about her. It's Karen, I believe oh, yeah, is her yeah. name. Yeah. How, um, now, how does that's <laughs> that's see now we didn't know that Mike Pence was going to be vice president with Dave Eggers was writing this book. Yeah, no, she doesn't. She doesn't come up by name. They don't come up by name. But just the the situation recently where we find out that he's always with her or. He had a special phone that he could call her on and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, when they're talking about the need to be completely transparent, um, they get elected representatives to wear these camera necklaces so that they can live a completely transparent career. And they start saying, well, no one's going to meet with me unless they're willing to be on camera. And soon after, any politician who's not willing to be transparent kind of gets out of office because – People think they have something to hide. So there's definitely that culture within the elected officials. But then Tom Hanks's character t- starts talking about um, about how when he used to go on business trips, about his wife used to tell him, I want you to behave as though you were wearing a camera that I could see the whole time. And it's this idea that mm. I've got nothing to hide um, type of thing that kind of played through, which reminded me of the recent headlines about Pence and his wife. Interesting. Huh. Well, this sounds all pretty much really mundane and scary as hell, buddy. Thanks for <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, last words you want to say about this? Yeah, just I think you were talking about it this morning's program um, with the brain, the thought texting. Yeah, I think that with, idea. By, yeah, you know, so. with Facebook and Johns Hopkins working together. Yeah. So um, the last, the last thing in the book is is May. Um, She's sitting bedside with her friend who's kind of gone into this coma after dealing with finding about her family history that she didn't want to face. And she's just sitting there bedside and, you know, any good friend would just worry about their friend and want them to get better. But May starts to think, gosh, I wonder what she's thinking about. And then she kind of has this light bulb moment of that's the next technology we need to to develop is something to be able to read the thoughts of people in a coma. So 
to me, the takeaway is, you know, no matter how far you try to retreat, we're going to come after you. You try to go off the grid, we'll find you. you. You go into a coma, we're going to invade your brain and pull your thoughts from your head. So, you know, it's definitely something to look forward to. All things are naked and open to the eyes of God. Every one of us will soon be able to see and cast judgment upon every other. Now, is that a quote from the Bible or is that a quote from the circle? I think it's a character misquoting the Bible in the circle. Ah, yeah. oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a strange mishmash of religion and culture, and that's what I try and do here on Media Monarchy. Jared, I appreciate you coming on here and talking about the circle. If you've got other probably films and books and music and all that kind of stuff, I'd love for you to do, do it again here in the Media Monarchy community. Awesome. Sounds great. All right, man. Take care. You too. I am a believer in the perfectibility of human beings. At the circle, we can finally realize our potential. When we are our best selves, there isn't a problem that we cannot solve. We can cure any disease and we can end hunger. Imagine the human rights implications. The possibilities are endless. Your payment, it was for 7813 and the bill was for 7831. Thank you. You got the job at the circle. <laughs> Have a drink, have a good time, and stay excited. You're at the circle. Hello, Hi, May. How are you? Jared here. I'll be doing your training. When I first started, it took me a few weeks to really get the hang of it. Believe me, you're doing fine. You should come visit me at work sometime. <laughs> you might think I was there to clean the toilets. Everyone really likes you. Your work's been exemplary, strong ratings, but your absence at several events. Sorry, my dad had an episode and I was home helping out. Is that related to his MS? I've been looking into your parents' situation, and I have an idea. I was thinking it would make sense for May's folks to come on the Circle Health Plan. I want to say how much I value what you've done for my family. May, you're a valued part of the Circle. We care about everybody you care about. May's only been with us for a few months, but she has made quite an impression. So, May, do you think you behave better or worse when you are being watched? We have cameras in place all over the world right now. What? We used to go on adventures. We used to have fun and see things, and now it's all filtered through this. Does this really seem okay to you? Watching you. I didn't create this. This is not what I had in mind. Watching you. Things at the circle, they need to change. Watching you. Everything recorded, seen, broadcast, is stored, and analyzed here. They can use it however they see fit, no matter what it's cost. Watching Knowing is good, but knowing everything is better. So, May, is there anything you want to tell us? You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.